Uh, my name is Robin Cassidy, and I'm the president of the Mono Basin Historical Society. And we'd like to welcome everyone to uh, our April meeting. Um, we hope everyone is enjoying the spring weather. No, it was pretty darn windy today. At least there is in Mono City. Um, just a few quick announcements before we get to our presentation. And um, one of those is we want to talk about our Adopt a Highway. And so Janet Carl is organizing our cleanup day to coincide with Earth Day. Robin, I'm afraid you- You're on you. talking up a storm. <laughs> I was muted the whole time. Okay, we're just gonna start again. So I um, wanna welcome everyone to our April meeting of the Mono Basin Historical Society and hope everyone's enjoying the spring weather. It was pretty windy today, at least in uh, Mono City it was. I've got a few announcements. Uh, we've got the um, MBHS uh, Adopt a Highway Cleanup Day. And Janet Carl is organizing our cleanup day to coincide with Earth Day this year, which is April 22nd. It's a Thursday. And the MBHS highway section is between Picnic Ground Roads and Tioga Pass turnoffs. If you'd like to help, please come to the Pioneer Solar Pavilion next to the museum at nine o'clock in the morning on April 22nd. Uh, and that's a Thursday. Bring some gloves, but uh, grabbers and bags and everything else that we need. Uh, Janet will have their waiting for us. And if you have any questions, please email Janet at Carl, C-A-R-L-E, Janet at gmail.com. And we, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so I can show you what has happened this last week. Let's see. So this is the Phil Athena house that uh, in September of 2020, what it looked like. And this was, we had Historicor come out and they were supposed to give us um, a bid on what it would cost to really shore the building up. And we've been unsuccessful in getting them to, uh, to give us much of, uh, of anything back. The, um, I, the person that we're working with has told us that uh, she's still working on it. But in the meantime, this is what happened last week to the building. It's really sad. And um, our Board of Directors President, uh, Dave Swisher, he went out and put some uh, caution tape around the building to try to keep people out. Um, we, Dave thinks that if we could spend $500 on lumber, he can get uh, volunteer labor and can get this building shored up and the wall put back. I, and if either Dave is on, um, maybe you guys can speak to it a little bit better than I can. But I, for what I understood from Dave Swisher was that they're going to rebuild this outer wall, but put it on a piece at a time, rather than trying to lift this whole big piece over here that, uh, that fell off. So uh, if you would like to donate, we would sure appreciate it. And um, in the chat, if you would like to send a chat to uh, the curator at monobasinhistory.org with a pledge, we would greatly appreciate it. Or if you'd like to just go directly to the web page, any help would really be appreciated. This is uh, going to be quite a project. And um, Dave Swisher believes that he can get the labor to, uh, to help take care of this. So that's Robin? what we've got. Yes. If I may, just a little bit about, for those who don't know, the Philocena House is a historic ranch house um, in the northwest part of the Mono Basin, um, up the hill off Highway 395 there. Um, and it's the, the home where uh, Lily Matthew um, 
grew up. Our, you know, Lily's our one of our oldest uh, old time residents of, of Levining and the Mono Basin, and author of a local book about. Um, um, oh gosh, I know, I'm trying to think of the name of the book. Man from Mono. Man from Mono. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. I always need help with names. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so we, the Historical Society, for decades have taken some responsibility for the building. It is on LADWP land, and they have not taken any, but they've allowed us to. So that's what we're working with here. Thank you, Dave. That was a great explanation. And uh, so the other thing I wanted to share with all of you is... Some work we've been doing on our website and let's see if I can get okay I wanted to show the um, our so we've got the monthly presentations a button here as well as under new events and what we have done is Dave Carl has done a wonderful job he actually has the calendar completely full for the year I don't have all of the presentations on, but many of them are on. So here, for instance, next month, David Woodruff is doing the Watterson Brothers, Villains or Victims. And, uh, and then the following month, our own Rich Foy is doing Hollywood Comes to the Loop. And then we got Jennifer Crittenden talking about the working dogs of the Eastern Sierra. And, and then we got our own Dave Carl in August. Uh, with the history of fire in Eastern California. Yay! Uh, I've got a few months skipped because we haven't gotten the names of the presentations yet. And then in November, uh, Chris Spiller, who is one of our trustees, she's going to do the energetic and amazing McTarnahan. And that sounds like it's going to be fun. I hadn't even heard of him before, so it's going to be fun listening to that one. So the other thing I wanted to show is that if you go down farther to, uh, we've been recording our presentations this, uh, this year. So the previous presentations are now listed along with the, um, the link to go, go to them uh, so that you can then see them online if you've missed them. I don't have the January one listed yet. I needed to get a couple of pictures, so I'll get that one up this week, and then those will all be recorded, as well as links to our online store for books that our presenters have uh, written. And I, uh, now we're ready to, I will stop sharing. And now I, it's my pleasure to introduce. Robin? Yes. Excuse me, this is Rich Foy. Um, yes. Uh, pledges for the Felicina House should go to who? There's no one uh, shown as a curator on ah, this chat. Is that John? It is John. Um, let's see. I thought he was going to log in as curator. But um, yeah, let's, if John is listed, let me see. Yes, John Warnicky is listed. So it would go to John Warnicky. But 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 made out to the Mono Basin Historical Society. Ab absolutely. And uh, either a check can be sent or you can go to the website. Um, so uh, the, this is John. I've just posted in the, the chat room for those interested in donating money for repairs at the Felicina House. You can send an email to curator at monobasinhistory.org. That way you can pay attention to this, this lovely presentation tonight and not worry about that. But you just send at your convenience to curator at monobasinhistory.org and I'll reply to you and I'll give you information about how to donate um, through our website or by check, whatever's best for you. Okay, John, thank you. Okay, so now it's my pleasure to introduce Negan Honeywell and Kay Ogden, who will be talking with us, or presenting at the Honeywell Ranch and the Eastern Sierra Land Trust. Kay is the um, CEO of uh, Eastern Sierra Land Trust, and Negan is a fifth generation member of the Honeywell family in Bridgeport. She works with her brother, Jeff, 
Sister Betsy, Sister-in-law Denise, various nieces, nephews, her son and daughters for the Honeywell Land and uh, Livestock Company that is both in Eastern California and Western Nevada. Negan graduated from UC Davis in 1991. Go Aggies! We have a lot of uh, UC Davis graduates here with us. Uh, <laughs> Dave Carl being one, my husband being one, Janet Carl, I'm sure there's a lot more. Uh, Negan is a former high school English teacher and has written for a local paper. In the summer, she lives in Bridgeport and manages the, brown, the barn portion of the Honeywell Guest Ranch. Winter months find her living in Smith Valley, Nevada, helping with the many facets of the, of the business. Vegan has always been the family historian and enjoys sharing her love of the local history and family history with her community. And we're so thankful you're sharing that with us this evening. Uh, Megan has three children, Dalton Honeywell Wright, who works for the ranch and is married to Ashley, a junior high math and science teacher in Smith Valley. Dalton and Ashley have a son, Leland Honeywell Wright, born December of 2020. And I'm sure he's getting ready to be working at the ranch here shortly as well. And uh, her daughter, oh boy. Rhiannon. 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 Honeywell Wright was a graduate from the University of Nevada, Reno this spring with a degree in agricultural science. Egan's youngest daughter, Aspen Honeywell Wright, is a junior at Smith Valley High School and also a student at Western Nevada College. Her husband, Bart Paul, is a local writer. He has written three books of crime fiction set in the Bridgeport Valley and surrounding area and one uh, nonfiction book about an early American bullfighter. And I was looking up the, um, the crime novels and I think I'm going to get them. <laughs> they look very interesting. So uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Megan and Kay and we're excited to hear all about the Honeywell Ranch. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna get my screen up here and share it. Okay. Can everyone hear me all right? Um, hopefully. And I'm off mute, right? Okay. Um, okay. So this is um, the first time I've done a Zoom presentation. So I'm ex having my 21-year-old uh, daughter help me here, get this all screen shared and set up. So I'll start out, the Honeywells in America um, came from the Alsace-Lorraine area of France, and they settled along the coast of Maine um, on the Kennebec River. Thomas Honeywell uh, served in uh, with General George Washington, and they didn't spell their name the way they spell it. We spell, we spell it today. The E and the I were switched around, and there were two N's, um, but when Napoleon Bonaparte came to California, he changed the spelling. It was like he decided he was making a break um, away from his family and he changed the spelling of his name and kind of never looked back. Um, he was born in 1828 and he sailed around Cape Horn in 1852, like so many people did for the gold rush. Um, and he mined for six years, kind of along the middle fork of the Yuba River. And um, then in 1859, he returned to Maine and married Esther Hughes, and they're in this picture together. Then um, in 1859, they sailed, along with her brother and, and her brother's wife, they sailed to Panama, and then they crossed the Isthmus of Panama. Um, the ladies rode mules and the guys hiked across the Isthmus of Panama. And then they came on up to California in 1859, and then, um, in 1860, their son Frank Honeywell was born, and they were living at that point in the Bay Area. And um, Napoleon had always had experience uh, with sawmills, and so he uh, bought a sawmill that was already in existence there in Woodside on the peninsula and um, set up, and they had their new son. And then within months of buying it, a flood wiped it out. So they kind of had to start all over again. And they heard from her brother about Aurora. And so they headed over the Sierra to Aurora. 
um, where uh, Esther's brother was living. And then they stumbled upon Bodhi. And this was in 1860 and into the spring of 1861. And at that point, of course, he decided you know, he had always was the, the lumberman. So he went into the Bridgeport Valley and he um, saw Buckeye Canyon across the valley there. And um, he realized that this would be a good place to get lumber. He'd been to Bodie, he saw the need for lumber. And um, so that's when he set up the mills. I mentioned that they had a son, Frank, and th they had one child, that was Frank, and he married Alice. And I'll talk a little bit more about her later on, but there's the, the historic pictures of them. This is, a, um, this is the historic plaque that sits in Buckeye Canyon that talks about, and it kind of talks about where the sawmill used to be situated. There isn't anything left of the sawmill. We have a lot of old um, parts of that sawmill that are moved down to the ranch in the valley because of course, uh, <laughs> one thing the Honeywells never did was tear down a building. So anytime they moved anything, they always just moved buildings. So a lot of the buildings that we have on the ranch, some of them were part of that original sawmill or roofs uh, were taken off the sawmill. We have roofs off buildings in Bodie. We have buildings from other ranches in Bridgeport because we just never tear anything down. Um, <laughs> and so anyway, but there's nothing left at the original site up there. And then they also had a sawmill up Eagle Creek and Eagle comes down into Buckeye Canyon. And so they uh, had a sawmill up there as well. And you can see if you hike up into the canyon, a lot of the, the marks from of those first growth trees that they cut down and they um, skidded them down the side hills and you can see kind of those where they came down those steep side hills into the canyon there. And then they rough cut them there at the mill and then they had oxen and those oxen took, it took three days to get them to Bodie and they um, took them across the, the valley and we still, there's a road kind of that you can see worn into the ground where they were carrying those heavy loads that goes, if you know where to look, directly across the Bridgeport Valley and, and goes to Bodie. Um, and then they got them up to, to Bodie and then they cut them, you know, into whatever they were going to use them for, whether it was buildings or mines um, or what have you. Um, what happened though later was that they put the Mono Mill, the, the railroad across, of course, and then he couldn't compete with the prices of, for the lumber. And so that was when he moved back, he changed his plan, moved down to the valley and they left, they had, had a cabin up by Buckeye Hot Springs and um, originally, and you could see the foundation up there. Uh, that's all that's left. It was just a little cabin, um, but they moved down to the, to the Bridgeport Valley and he bought what was called the Bailey Homestead. That was the first piece of property that he bought in the valley. And then he homesteaded on some property. And then of course he had his Esther homesteaded on some property and then Frank homesteaded on some property. And then he bought other people's homesteads too. Of course, people initially homesteaded there thinking they could make it on smaller pieces of property, but they didn't realize how short the growing season was in Bridgeport. So a lot of those people were really glad to sell to him. And so that's kind of how he accumulated the, the larger property that became Honeywell Ranch um, with, those piece, with those pieces. Um, and... Then in 1880, they built the ranch house um, and, and started, and of course, this is an early picture. If you've been into Bridgeport, and I might have a picture later, I think, but the, there's, of course, we're surrounded by trees now, and the house looks a little different uh, than this picture, but this is what it looked like originally. And um, NB was always kind of looking for things to do and he filed on water at Lower Twin Lakes. Um, he kind of got in on the ground floor, uh, Lower Twin Lakes and filed on that water um, and made it a reservoir site there in Bridgeport. Um, he helped found, found the toll roads on Sweetwater. He put up bonds to help with the Bridgeport um, courthouse also. He was kind of big into that. And then 
I talked a little bit about Frank and Alice, and these are Frank and Alice's three children. So Frank, um, of course, was born there in Woodside, but he grew up in Bridgeport, and he um, went to school in Aurora to start out with. They sent him to live with his aunt and uncle in Aurora because there was no school in Bridgeport. And then later they built an elementary school in Bridgeport. And so he went to elementary school in Bridgeport. And then as kind of a middle teenager, they sent him to Berkeley uh, to a boarding house to go to high, to high school. It was called the Berkeley Gymnasium. And then later he went to UC David, uh, excuse me, UC, UC Berkeley, um, and then came back to Bridgeport and worked with, with his dad and um, became a Mono County supervisor. And uh, his wife, he met her because her family owned the boarding house that he lived in in Berkeley. And she had come from Maine also, and she had gone to the New England Conservatory of Music. And so one thing that you find in our ranch house is a uh, Steinway piano that was a, was a wedding present to her from her in-laws. And it, it sailed around the horn and uh, actually belonged to the Bodie Moot uh mining superintendent's wife but um esther and nb bought it to make sure alice would have a place to um play the piano when she moved to bridgeport from berkeley and married their son and then um these are their three kids stanley lucille and millie stanley was my grandfather and then he had a son named stan who was my dad and then um lucille is the oldest in the middle there and then millie was the middle and uh, kind of some interesting things about them and they worked together on the ranch, all three of them. Lucille was one of the first women packers in the Sierra. We called her Aunt Lou and my dad always said she didn't take any, she was a tough lady and nobody gave her any lip at any time. She was, she was pretty amazing. And my Aunt Millie, whom I did know, um, she wrote a history about our family, and I'll show you the cover later here in the in the presentation and talk a little bit about kind of the reason we know so much is because Millie was really the earliest historian keeping track of, of the family. <clears throat> and then, of course, my grandfather was Stanley Sr. Um, these are some pictures I have of my Aunt Millie. That's her on horseback. And... Uh, this is up in the Buckeye Canyon. That cabin doesn't exist anymore, but that was up in Buckeye Canyon. Buckeye was where, you know, we first had property and we still do. We still graze cattle up there today. And that was where they used, they grazed the oxen that they used to bring the lumber across. The Bridgeport Valley was up in the Buckeye Canyon. And, um, and we still call it the ox meadow up there. Um, Moving on a little bit, here's some pictures of the early Bridgeport ranchers. Um, that picture on with of the men standing and talking there. Um, my dad's with his back to the camera. My grandfather is kneeling down. And then uh, Harvey Ladd, the Ladd family were early um, homesteaders in Bridgeport. And he's kind of in the middle. And I think we have um, Frederick Dressler and um, we have so one of the Strohsniders in there too. So other br early Bridgeport ranchers in that kind of a cool captured moment. And then of course an early branding at the ranch. This is the book that I was talking about. My great aunt wrote Millie Honeywell Hamlet. She wrote this called The Saga of the Circle H and she documented the family history from 1861 to 1961. We still have a few copies of it and um, my niece Leslie is working on actually putting, uh, you know, kind of we'll print it ourselves and make a few more copies that we keep in our gift shop at our at our guest ranch. Um, and then these are pictures of kind of the that next generation of. Uh, so Stanley had <clears throat> Stanley Senior had um, four children. He had two son, three sons, including my dad, and uh, a daughter. And then Lou ha had a son, and then their, Millie didn't have any children, and these are some of that generation, right, and some burrows they caught. Um, and so my, my grandfather, Stanley Sr., married my grandmother, Lenore Honeywell, and um, 
course, the depression came and she was a school teacher from Iowa and kind of a real people person and a, and a go-getter. And so when, when beef prices were so bad that they couldn't pay the taxes on the ranch and they were kind of all figuring out, Lou and Millie and Stanley were trying to figure out what the heck they were going to do. Um, my grandma Lenore had the idea that they could take guests and that Bridgeport was such a pretty place and the ranch had a had a great history and some great fun things to do and so anyway that's a picture of my grandma Lenore right there and that's a picture of my dad and he's on the wagon with some guests he's a young guy there and she had that idea and they started it they moved out of the ranch house and they let the guests moved in and they stayed in tents or they stayed in the shop at different times and then they built these little shacks for the family to stay in and put the the guests in the ranch house then eventually over the years built the cabins that we have now and kind of worked up to what we have today here's some other guest ranch early guest ranch pictures and you could see um kids feeding calves going to the travertine hot spring that couple there with the real dated looking cowboy hat and stuff that's their when they used to do that i even remember as a kid we took guests over to Big Hot and, and to Travertine. Of course, we don't do that anymore. We don't cross 395 and go over um, with guests anymore. And then there's some guests moving cows in the, in the early days when we had Hereford cattle. Um, this is a picture of then, this was picture was taken around, I would guess 1970. Um, that's my parents my dad stan i'm on his shoulder that's my mom jan honeywell and then my grandma lenore and then my sister and brother my brother jeff is on the far side and my sister betsy in the blue shirt and so kind of to talk about some of the things that we're we've moved on and are doing today um so as of course we raise cattle we're working cattle ranch there and in the summer we graze cattle in bridgeport up in buckeye canyon and up in eagle we have permits in eagle and then we've expanded in in recent years so we're also grazing cattle um in the Bodie hills in the summer as well so when the flying m ranch was bought um and the nevada part of it was bought not by a nifwif um, we were fortunate enough to be able to get um, the California part of the Flying M Ranch, which includes uh, those permits that are along Mono Lake and the Bodie Hills. And then we also lease from NIFWIF in on the Nevada side on the East Walker. So we run cattle there as well. And then we also, in the drought that we had a few years ago, we're looking before we even did that expansion we bought a permit at whiskey flat and garfield and so we also run cattle in that part of the world which if you take that road that so many of you i know that live in the mono basin maybe go to hawthorne and so you've been by whiskey flat and seen our cattle out that direction and these are some pictures um of that's my brother we're crossing some cows across buckeye creek there and then that's buckeye right there and then these are some picture is a winter picture and then that's some of our cows at Bodie I think that was just last summer when some of those old gals came in and we try to get them out of there but they like to go visit with the tourists in Bodie and then um, here we are Bodie Hills again I just thought that would be fun to kind of um, include some of that and then that's kind of just trying to get you through to where we are today and um, if there's, let me look and make sure I didn't forget anything that I was gonna say to you or, and maybe some questions. Oh, I know what I was gonna mention a little bit that um, the early days that they did was um, the early day, Frank Honeywell and um, Stanley Sr., they were really interested in uh, fishing and they loved to fish. And so one of the thing, early things they did in the high mountains is they stocked a lot of the high mountain lakes like um in my aunt millie's book she talks about them taking fish on the backs of uh mules up to barney lake up to peeler lake tamarack lake um cutthroat trout 
and you know and they have to stop at every stream and run water into those little cans they had to try to get keep the fish alive to get them up to the high country because they really um, wanted to make sure that they could get some fish up there to some of those beautiful lakes um, and then 1920 Stanley senior um, yeah and his friend Rainbow Gibson planted golden trout at Honeywell Lake which is up above Tamarack Lake and I guess Gibson's the one that named it um, Honeywell Lake so those were just some kind of interesting facts I thought oh I can't forget that um, but anyway and if you have any other questions we'll answer them later on I think it's time go we'll let Kay go ahead and do her part of the presentation Thanks, Megan. That was amazing. I um, every time I get to learn more about your amazing, rich family history, it's it's astounding, and it just makes me even more excited about the collaboration that we have. You've just showed all these wonderful things from the past and the present, and hopefully, because of our collaboration, it's going to keep going, which is so exciting. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about Eastern Sierra Land Trust. So I just wanna make sure, can you see my screen? Everybody see that okay? Uh, I'm gonna go forward unless I hear anything in the chat. Um, so, well, it would be nice if I could go forward. Here we go. So ESLT is based in Bishop and um, I'm gonna give a lot of information in a short period of time so that we've got plenty of time for Q and A. So uh, our service area is Inyo County, Mono County, Alpine County, and Western Nevada. We are an accredited land trust, which means we hold ourselves to very high standards that a national organization, the Land Trust Alliance Accreditation Commission holds. It's rigorous, it's expensive, it's hard, but only I think it's the um, top 18% of all land trusts in the nation are accredited. And we also, this year, we're turning 20 years old. So happy birthday to ESLT this year. Now, a lot of people say, what is a land trust? And when I first came to ESLT, it's gonna be eight years in just a couple of weeks. Honestly, I wasn't so sure what a land trust did. It's really complicated, but on the, on the top of it, it's really simple. And it's a nonprofit organization working with willing landowners. That's a really key terminology that's super important. Some people think um, that we don't work with willing landowners and it is only willing landowners and the community to permanently preserve um, important lands, critical lands, either by donations or we purchase the lands or we do negotiate the private and voluntary uh, conservation easements. And ESLT only works in, uh, with permanent conservation. Some do 15, 30, we only do um, in, in perpetuity. And this is our mission. So Eastern Sierra Land Trust, you can see not only are we working with willing landowners, but the other things that we're looking at is a pretty broad scope. So it gives us a lot of flexibility in the projects that we get to work on. So scenic, agricultural, natural, recreational, historical, and watershed. And one thing that isn't in here, but it's, it's bound in with agriculture are the economic benefits, because there are definitely economic benefits that come from keeping our working lands as working lands. This is a picture right now, and it is not up to date because I have breaking news. Uh, but this picture is, hopefully you can see it, it's a map of our current projects, except just last week we closed on another project. Uh, so another 1,400 acres in Huntoon Valley is now permanently protected. So we'll be sending out um, information on that in the next coming weeks. So that means we have protected over 20,000 acres. So 20,000 acres in 20 years. Um, we feel pretty proud of that. And we do it through three main programs. So we have a program called Community Connections, and this is our outreach to our community. We, we really want to be good neighbors. And so we work with kids. We have a program called Birds and Binos. We have the Sunflower Kids, where we work um, with 
children who maybe don't get out all the time. Certainly with COVID, things have changed, but we're hoping to be able to do some in person perhaps this summer. We also do volunteer restoration and stewardship days. And in fact, we've got um, our migrat International Migratory Bird Day coming up in early May. And many of you might know, we also certify pollinator habitat in home gardens. And um, we've got some webinars coming up. It's on our website if you're interested. You don't have to be certified to attend the free webinars. Another program is our wildlife program. And this is the one that we, you know, work to protect habitat, migration corridors. We've been working a lot lately on the bi-state sage grouse. And in fact, the funding for a lot of our recent projects have come because we're saving sage grouse habitat. Because, you know, like deer and birds, they don't really know, is this public land? Is this private land? So it's important that we work together with other land managers to protect the, the vast landscapes that we have here. We're also just recently involved in a project called the Mammoth Lakes Highway 395 Safety. I think it's corridor, I, I forgot to put that on there. And that's where working with a broad collaboration to um, hopefully build a wildlife corridor around Mammoth, uh, Highway 395. It'll, depending on when we get the funds and where it's going to be, but that will help protect a lot of different species. Then of course, we've got our permanent land protection program. And this is where um, we work to protect these vital lands in, in those three counties in Western Nevada that I spoke of. So right now we have, uh, we own, so we had people give us or we did purchase with grants a few places, but mostly it's because people gave it to us. Um, so we own about 2,300 acres conservation easements we have a little over 13,000 deed restricted it's a special category but it was a uh, we are legally obligated to monitor this for um, conservation values again and that's about 3700 acres and then we transferred to ownership six public ownership uh, forest service um, 60 acres and we've got another 40 pending you may have heard about that project up lundy canyon and I just want to highlight here, obviously, what's what we've been talking about is, is the Honeywell Ranch. And that was 4,100 acres, now permanently protected, with an easement that closed in August. It is um, to protect bi-state sage grouse habitat and other species um, migration. We were able to purchase this through federal funds from the Farm Bill, state funds through the Wildlife Conservation Board, and the California Deer Association. They're a very important partner with us. And just quickly, you know, what is a conservation easement? It's basically a legally binding tool between volunteer landowners with agencies and ESLT for the public benefit to protect and preserve certain spaces, spaces for certain reasons. And once the easement is designed, it protects conservation values that are defined on the property. It restricts certain uses. And one thing that people sometimes isn't clear, the landowner retains ownership of that land. We merely hold the easement. We call it holding over the land, but it, um, it stays with the land forever. So it's been attached to that land through a legal process. And then once we complete an easement, we do then work with the landowner or landowners in perpetuity because we're responsible with the landowner for um, upholding the conservation values. And how does it work? It's, it's a long process as um, Megan and her family can, can uh, let, it, let you know it, this project was about, this, this time around was about five years. Um, there was a previous um, go at it, but it, things didn't work out for a lot of reasons. So this project has, was in the works for about five hard years of, of hard work. And that was talking with the landowner and ESLT. And of course, when we get funds, those funds come with certain restrictions. So everybody collaborates together and comes up with this final document. And then ESLT purchases at fair market value, according to appraisal, um, the development rights, and then we legally extinguish them. So it goes through ESCO and those development rights are permanently extinguished. So um, even if the land is sold, 
the easement goes with it. And, and the landowner, excuse me, continues to own and manage the land. And ESLT will work with the landowner to monitor the property at least once a year to make sure the values are being upheld. And of course, we do all this with um, lots of open conversation because there's you know, lots of variances that we need to work together on. <clears throat> and then I just want to be really, really clear that um, conservation easements cannot happen without visionary landowners. And this is a picture of Jeff, Megan's brother. And um, I just want to thank Jeff and Jan and Megan and the whole family because because of them, oh gosh, I was swore I wasn't going to do this. Because of them, those that beautiful ranch that you saw the pictures of will will be like that forever. Obviously, climate change will impact forever, but it will not be subdivided. There will not it will not be broken up. It's going to remain intact. So that's that's what I've got, and I just want to say um, there's my email, and we'll answer some questions now. But if you've got um, questions that we can't get to now, feel free to uh, contact me through email. I'm going to stop sharing and turn it over to Robin, I guess. Well, thank you so much, Kay and Megan. Boy, that's really awesome. Mm -hmm. uh, what I'm going to do is I am going to I'm going to try to get to the chat and then start reading some of these questions to you. So we'll start from the top. And uh, when the guest, and this is from Dave Carl, when the guest ranch began to attract visitors, where did they come from mostly? So primarily, and even still today with the visitors that we get, really it's in California, the Bay Area and Los Angeles. So I would say like, um, mostly people come really from California. Uh, of course, we get a few visitors from other places, but in those early days, it was the same. They came from um, the Bay Area in Los Angeles. Okay, and thank you. And then uh, Jana asks, are you still having guests in the summer? Yes, we and are. How many, <laughs> okay, and how many head of cattle does Honeywell have? Right now, we have about 1,200 head of cattle. Okay, and you said that you are still having guests at the ranch? We are. We are still actively having guests at the ranch. And even through COVID, we had guests in a modified way eating outside last summer. But we'll be back at it again this summer. Oh, that sounds fun. I don't know. Uh, what kind of cattle do you have? Primarily Red Angus, uh, Black Angus, and, uh, and Cross of that. Um, we've over the years transitioned. You saw in those early pictures, they had Hereford cattle. And that's what it was when I was a kid. And then in my dad's day, we had some more exotic continental breeds like Limousine. And uh, now we went to Red Angus for a long time and Black Angus. We just bought a Hereford bull. We haven't had a Hereford bull here for 40 years. And I just picked one up the other day. So. Um, it's you want to keep some hybrid vigor in there, but primarily right now you'd see red and black Angus. Okay. Okay. This is fun. <laughs> uh, Dave Carl asked, will you talk about the Conway Ranch, please? And I think this one was uh, geared to Kay. Sure. I, I don't want to derail the conversation uh, too much because Conway, as we all know, is a big, deep, bucket of complexity and interest and, and fascination. Dave, did you have a specific question about Conway or were, maybe you're talking about the grazing that just um, was approved? No, not really. I was. I thought you might want to simply explain that Eastern Sierra Land Trust has a role to play up there now. Oh, we sure do. So I think it was in 2015 Maybe it was is December 2014, ESLT and Mono County and the previous funders, uh, Caltrans, California Parks and Recreation, and NIFWIF all completed a conservation easement at Conway Ranch. So the county owns that land, so it's publicly owned, public access, and the easement is over it, and we we work to uphold the conservation values. And recently, um, you may have seen that um, 
uh, there's now allowable use of, the easement has always said this, the county has just agreed that um, well-managed cattle grazing in uh, appropriate amount can happen at Conway. And it went out to bid and the Honeywell family um, got, that, uh, got that proposal. So um, the cows that Megan's talking about, I, I don't know, Megan, what, what cows are you gonna put out at Conway? <laughs> yep, there'll be some Honeywell cows, probably some those same red and black Angus cows I was talking about earlier. We have to do some fencing um, before we put any cows out there, but we're excited that we we got the bid on that. So yeah, those cows at the Conway and at the Matley will be ours. And my son's already talking with Justin Alder with the county to irrigate and they're getting on it right now. So we're in the process. It's, it's really exciting to have uh, such a, a well-respected local rancher um, now in charge of this out at Conway. So we're excited. Dave, okay, that great. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, how many horses are at the Honeywell Ranch, Megan? 170. Wow. Do you have mules too? No, we don't. They're all horses. Okay, and um, does it, this one's back to Kay. Does a conservation easement require that agriculture continues, continues like our MALT in the Bay Area? And this is from Dewey Livingston. Um, it depends on the easement, but our agricultural conservation easements do require that it stays in ag. That's part of the whole protection. That's what the funding sources are to keep it is, as working lands. Some of our easements are not agricultural easements. They are um, conservation easements and they have different um, allowed use and prohibited uses. Okay, thank you. And then we have from Elizabeth, where do you get your cow horses from? And do your horses graze on the 41 acres or do you supplement their food? And where do you get their hay from? So there's a number of questions there, but uh, yes, <laughs> um, we get our horses all over the place. We raise some of our horses and, and start them and, and ride them and get them going. We buy them. People kind of know we're always in the, in the market for general horses and local cowboys. I go to horse sales. So we get our horses from a lot of different places and then we work them into our program over time. Then you were asking if they graze. Yeah, primarily they're grazing on that Bridgeport grass. Um, actually, we're moving our horses to Bridgeport Wednesday in two days. We'll be hauling them up there and they will be um, up there. We save grass in the fall, so we'll have it in the spring before it starts to come. And they do really well because horses actually do better when they're grazing all the time rather than like the way we've kind of um, created them to eat hay at certain times. Of course, sometimes you can't help that. But anyway, that's the way what they do. And then they're in Smith Valley in the winter time. I think was that all she asked oh. me. She said that if if they do you if they do have eat I, I'm paraphrasing if they eat hay where does the hay come from? Oh, okay. And that's not in Bridgeport in Smith Valley in the winter time, especially some of the older horses we have that maybe their teeth are not so great anymore. We do supplement some of those older horses with hay and it comes from Smith Valley. Uh, there's a, a number of people here that grow hay. Okay. And then, thank you. Steve Moore uh, asks, when I worked in Bodie in 73 to 75, those flying M cows loved the ghost town then too. It was remarkable to see the face of one of those ladies inches away through the bathroom window. So I think that was a good comment. And then Dave Carl asks, can we buy locally raised grass-fed beef from you? Actually, that's a great question. So hopefully by this summer you will be able to buy some locally fed or order grass-fed beef from us. We're working on that. We've sort of had fits and starts of starting that, um, but my daughter who's graduating from college is, uh, this spring is working on getting us up and going with some the ability to sell some of our grass-fed beef. So Dave, give us a call this summer and we'll see what we can set you up with. I'll be calling you too. <laughs> 
Okay, and then Janet says she's always impressed with the calm horses at the Bridgeport Parade. How do you keep 50 horses rid ridden by dudes so calm? Well, um, one of the things, we've been doing it a long time, and I remember I, we've had a few parades where we had a few horses that weren't as calm as we would have liked. But one of the things that's great about, um, well, horses are herd animals. And so we ride in that big group and we run them for a breast. And we usually have our wranglers kind of rimming the outside with calm horses. And um, we talk to the guests at first ahead of time, like tell them, you know, the, they feed off your energy, so the calmer you are, the calmer they will be. But most of those horses have all been in the parade before. We either, the Wranglers or the family have ridden them through before we put a guest on them, usually. And um, then, so they're side, they're, they're just next to each other and they get confidence from each other. So like, it's harder for a horse to go through a parade by itself, mm -hmm. but in a group of 60 or whatever, they get confidence from each other and they go through. And that's not to say, a few years ago, they added some new speakers right in front of the courthouse. Like, I think it was three or four years ago. And they were so loud that a couple of our horses, especially one of them just panicked and went spinning backwards. And we had to, we of course know what to do when a couple of us got a hold of that horse and got, got him through, but the, it hurt its ears. So then we talked to the parade guys the next year and we said, can we move those speakers back a little bit so that when we're right in front of the courthouse with those speakers blaring, that it won't freak out some of the horses. So we're not always perfect, but yeah, I'm pretty proud of those horses. They do well. That's really cool. Um, let's see, we've got a question. Do you rent horses for daily rides? No, we do not. Uh, just for the people that come for a week or more. In the Bridgeport Valley, I would tell you there's um, Virginia Lakes Pack Station and Levitt Meadows on either side of us, kind of, they, they do daily rides. Okay, and we've got another one. Do you ever sell any of your cow horses? No, we don't. I mean, not if they're oh. good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I sort of thought that might be the answer. Um, I've got a question, so it's not in the chat. Um, uh, during the, and I've never been to it, the 4th of July um, rodeo, do you have a lot of activity and participation in that ranch rodeo? Well, um, so we have people from the ranch, like my son uh, generally is in that rodeo and um, a couple other people that work for us are in that rodeo a couple of years ago. I think my, what year was, anyway, my son won the bronc riding in that rodeo, I think three or four years ago. Um, but mo I mean, we don't put that on or anything. Centennial, it's in their arena, but we support it. And then of course my son, my son does participate in it and we, you know. All right, and uh, let's see. This one, um, let's see, from Greg Hammer. Uh, what is the relationship between the ranch and Doc and Al's resort? Um, well, I mean, we're neighbors and uh, we get along with them. It, it's initially that property was sold, I mean, a long time ago. My Aunt Lou, I believe, sold that property, um, you know, in like the 40s. And um, so it was part of the ranch originally, um, but, and there is, they have some water rights out at Robinson Creek, but we get along great with them. And, uh, you know, they're right there as a good neighbor. Okay. And then um, we've got a question. Do you have a book coming out, Megan? No, I don't. And uh, <laughs> at some point, maybe we'll, we kind of need to update from 1861. I mean, excuse me, 1961, where my Aunt Millie left off, I suppose, to uh, where we are today. And I, I, people have asked me that. And so maybe we'll get on that here in the next little bit, but not right now. Thanks. Okay. We'd love that. <laughs> okay. And then we have one from Steve Moore. Where specifically is the Huntoon Valley property recently close on? So this one might be for Kay. And he says, my memory is a few miles north on 395 from Bridgeport. Steve, you are 100% correct. So as you go out of Bridgeport and you go across the valley, you make that hard right. It's about five miles straight out that way. It's called the Ullman Ranch. And it used to be, um, sheep used to be out there. 
and it was run by the Sario family. And it, it's the place I've always gone through forever. And I'm like, how did that happen? Why is there a house on one side and a garage or other structure on the other side of 395? They're both painted the same color. That is part of the ranch. And um, one of those buildings though, is a red barn and it was a historic stagecoach stop. So. I'll be darned. Hmm. Okay. Oh, oh, let's see, another one just popped through. How do you transport 170 horses from Smith Valley to Bridgeport, and how many horses do you transport in one rig? We actually trail, we'll trailer them in gooseneck trailers, and uh, depending, we have a number of different rigs, and we have some people that work, or we hire for the day that, that help us out too. So seven mm -hmm. to six horses in a rig that go, and so we make a number of trips to get them there. Um, we have in the past, we've just gotten busy and maybe my brother and sister and I have gotten a little old, but we have done some horse drives where we drove <laughs> them and uh, we haven't done that in a few years, but I know our younger generation is always itching for us to do our horse drive again, but normally we just haul them with, uh, with our goosenecks and you'll see our trailers going back and forth. Okay, and oh, we've got one more. It's a comment. Um, this is from Bill May, and he said he just found a copy of the Saga of the Circle H on eBay and got it for $13.50 plus shipping. That's awesome. Who knew that would be on eBay? That's great. <laughs> that is really amazing. <laughs> That's great. That is great. Well, I thank you, Megan and Kay, so much. This has been informative. It's been fun. We so much appreciate you taking your time so very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, I just want to remind, thank you. And I just want to remind everyone, uh, next month, our May meeting is May 3rd. And, uh, and that will be Dave Woodruff on the villains, or let me see, I can't remember what their names are. Um, oh my goodness. What is it, Dave Carl? <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> it was a, it's about the Watersons, and it's where are they villains or are they victims? I think was this, you know, there's another view. That was it. Villains or victims? Thank you, Dave, for bailing me out there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you all so much, and what a great program. We appreciate you so much taking your time and appreciate everyone attending tonight. And uh, if you can uh, donate to help us take care of the Philistina Ranch, we would greatly appreciate it. And uh, thank you so much and have a great evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you.